Let's open with a word of prayer. Holy God, as we continue the discussion and study of your word, for many of us, this is your holy, sacred Sabbath day. And we can spend no better time in the meditation of your thoughts that you give to us. As we continue to try to understand your will, for your people, we ask that you would give us grace and wisdom. Be with me, be with the translators, and most of all, and most of all, be with the congregation who are listening. In Jesus' name, Amen. I want to welcome everybody. It only seems like a few days ago that we were together. These weekend meetings seem to be coming more frequent. I hope most of you find this format helpful so i want to clear up some misconceptions i want to clear up some misconceptions I would have hoped by now that when I am presenting, people would understand when I am using parabolic methodology. I realize that for the past 15 to 18 months, particularly when it comes to my presentations, the focus of attention has shifted. from the number four to the number six. From the first four commandments to the last six commandments. To the golden rule. Prior to that change, there were, prior to that change, there were people who were putting pressure upon me and asking me to join together the model of the nature of man and the model of the Sunday law. I express it another way. Because that's not the terms that were used when those when that pressure was being applied. They would want me to explain 
the difference between morality and prophecy. Nature of man, Sunday law. And I kept on trying to tell people that there wasn't any difference. This is a 100% prophetic message. No, it's not. It's 100% a moral message. And this continues to confuse people. I want to make a comment, but this is not germane to the point I want to make. Since our message has become so moralistic, so humanistic, Elder Tess and myself have noticed a trend. And if I can put it succinctly in the following way. People have stopped caring. People don't care about organization. They think they have the right to be disrespectful to leadership. At a, sometimes at a very personal level. And people seem to think that they are in a dilemma now. That they feel some kind of liberty, some kind of right. To get on with their own lives. People are going into business. Exploring careers. Now, I want people to understand what I'm about to say and not misunderstand me. Perhaps if I might find a Bible verse. So he won't blame me for saying this. Let's turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19. We'll read 19 and 20. As you're turning there, the comment I'm making is that people seem to be under a delusion, a deception. People seem to think we have slipped into a humanistic message. And therefore they need to take care of their humanity. Or as inspiration would call it, the cares of this life.
But I want to remind all of you of the following. You surely know that your body is the temple where the Holy Spirit lives. The spirit is in you and is a gift from God. Therefore, you no longer own your own body. God paid a great price for you. You owe God a debt. So use your body to honor God. So I hope that verse touches a chord in your heart. As you consider your behavior and your relationship to God. And to God's church. And consider your duty and your obligations. In case you need reminding, which I suspect many of you do. We are closer to the end than when we first began. And if you're going to get tied up, if you're going to get lost in the cares of this life, you should take heed to yourselves. And I've given three examples of this. A disrespect of organization, a disrespect of leadership and people getting on with their own lives. This is not a humanistic message. This is not a humanistic movement. This is the movement that follows prophecy and law keeping. I want to remind us a verse that I have used many times in the past. John chapter 13, verse 34. Jesus speaking. Jesus says, I give you a commandment. Not a new one. One that you have forgotten. Therefore, it's new to you. So this humanistic modeling that we discuss. Is a commandment. And the commandment says, love one another, not love yourself.
not take care of yourself. And it's not even talking about taking care of your family or your children or your spouse. The, the one that you're supposed to love We can either use the word neighbor but it's talking about church member and in a few short years from when this statement was given the rules didn't change the church just got bigger And John, the author of that book, in 2 John chapter 1, verse 5, 2 John 1, 5, speaking to one of his flock, repeats the word of Jesus. Speaking about this same commandment. The point I wanted to bring to you. Just because in my studies, I focus a lot on human relationships. Don't be deceived. This is all prophecy. And the only way, there is no other way. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth and the life. And I have presented on several occasions. The introduction of the book Christ Object Lessons. And Jesus did not teach in parables. Mm -hmm. Jesus was the parable. As a man or a person thinks, so are they. Something that Adventists do not understand, find it hard to answer. They come up with long, flowery arguments or they have no understanding. The two questions you have to ask and have answered. Why did Jesus die? And where did Jesus die? Two questions, why and where? The second question can only be answered if you understand parabolic methodology. And this is something that I have labored to explain. If you want to understand God, the spiritual being who is in heaven, the only way you can do that is by understanding the human. To understand the divine, you have to understand the human. 
If you want to understand your relationship to the divine, to God. It can only be discovered, only be understood, only be learned, uh, discovered, learned, understood. Through human relationships. This is why the message seems to have shifted from what people call prophecy to morality. We were liars. There was a time that we were supposed to be teachers. But God had to send someone to us. Because there was a time when we were supposed to teach. And we didn't understand things. We were liars. So someone had to come and teach us again. Hebrews chapter five. The time had come when we were supposed to be teachers, but we needed to be taught again. And what was the lie? First John. Chapter four, verse 20. We loved an invisible God. More than we loved the visible human form. We focused upon the four commandments the fourth commandment until not only our message but our lives had become as dry as the hills of Gilboa Following in the footsteps of our four parents. So we were sent a messenger to get us back on track. Just as God had to send those messengers in the 1888 history. So even though our message, even though my messages may seem moralistic. The only way they can be decoded and understood. Is using parables. It's always been that way. It always will be that way. And what people are beginning to do is get excited. And all they want is the answers. Not the methodology. You might ask yourself, what's the problem with that? There are several. I'll give you one.
Mark chapter 8, verse 18. Mark chapter 8, verse 18. Could we halt for two minutes? to me therefore will i call upon him the name of the lord O oh lord i beseech thee deliver my soul what shall i render unto the lord for all his benefits toward me i will take the cup of sad Ready. On the name of the Lord. The name of the Lord. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, we can Sorry. hear you. I had technical problems with my audio. Okay. So we're in Mark chapter 8, verse 18. And the problem with rushing to the answer and not going through the methodology. is answered in this verse. Having ears, they hear not. So what happens is people don't listen to what I'm saying. This point that I'm making is connected to the previous point. People are wrapped up in their lives now, too focused upon their own lives. They've forgotten that the liberty that they now standing was given to them as a gift. I say a gift, but that's a lie. Eternal life is not a gift. Even if you think the scriptures teach that, it's not so. Eternal life cannot be bought with money. But it's expensive. It costs you everything. So when you start focusing upon your own life, the cares of this life. Because you think eternal life is cheap. You're making a mistake to your own destruction.
I'm not speaking about a particular individual. So don't think I'm pointing the finger at you. But this is a phenomena, an issue that's getting increasingly problematic. People think this message teaches you to get on with your own life. And for the past 18 months, I've only taught one thing. The new commandment to love your fellow church members. That coupled with the following problem. This is a prophetic message, not a humanistic one. And it follows the same rules today as it did yesterday. So all of that was the introduction to a point that I wanted to clarify. Let's address an issue, not answer the issue. Let's address an issue. I will say this in a way that will frustrate and anger people. Mm -hmm. You, Christians in general, think marriage is the greatest thing. This movement has one of the highest separation rates or divorce rates that I've ever come across. And in the history of the formalization of the message, I think it's wonderful that the rates are so high. Now, coupled with this issue is an understanding of why it's so high. Now, we can speak about marriage it's not so unique it's just one form of what i consider five relationships which we have discussed many times between us now in our studies we've spoken about Matthew 19, I've been discussing that chapter for several presentations now. And all of us know what the verses teach. It's all about the rules of marriage and divorce. And because we're all so excited that we don't have to follow a thus saith the Lord, we want to expand our horizons of what truth is We're all excited and waiting for the great news. 
When can I remarry? For any reason that takes my fancy. You don't express it that way because you're too Christian. So you're looking for narrow limits or limited reasons for divorce. Death, that's not enough. Adultery, that's not enough. And what is it? What is the one that everyone's so excited about? We should all be able to give this answer right now. Abuse, of course. You're all desperate for me to tell you that you can remarry after you've been abused. Nine eleven was an important date, but it wasn't that important. People have ears, but they're not listening. And last month, I did not give this movement permission to remarry on grounds of the of abuse. For I know that people think that I said that. I like listening to myself less than you like listening to me. But I had to force myself on the last presentation I did. I went over it with a fine tooth comb. And at one hour, 10 minutes, that, that's, that's the timestamp. You can go and check, but not right now. I compared and contrasted some things. I was discussing voluntary celibacy. That was the subject of that presentation. And because I'm foolish or because I'm provocative, we'll go with the former. I chose to give an example. of what voluntary actions were not. The example I gave was an abusive marriage. So I, I said, forced celibacy is evil. Then I gave an example, which has nothing to do with forced celibacy. The parable, if you check carefully, if you compare and contrast, was about choice. We're going to juxtapose two stories, one of choice, one of no choice. Choice was the celibacy story. No choice 
was the abusive relationship story. And we juxtapose them. But people are so desperate. To get married, I guess I don't to, to remarry. Because we're in the history of marriage. All they want to hear is, can I remarry, please? And they think that I said that they had my permission. So for all those people who are not listening properly, the parable was the following. Women who are in abusive relationships and stay in those relationships are not making a free voluntary choice. Even if they say they are. If they go to the police station after being assaulted by their husband. And they say, I'm not going to press charges. In the olden days. It's today in some countries still. What will the police say to the woman? They'll shrug their shoulders and say, it's your choice. If I were you, I wouldn't be abused, but it's your choice. I'm not a psychologist. Nor a counsellor. But I know one thing. And a trained police person knows the same thing. The woman is not making a choice to not press charges. She's under pressure. She's being forced somewhere in her story In her experience, she's been pressurized not to do the right and proper thing. This is, and in the next statement, is where I get into trouble. One of the reasons why she is being forced not to get her husband into trouble one of the reasons she's been forced to remain in that relationship is because she has no financial freedom it's slavery and we're going to touch on the subject of slavery in coming presentations related to this subject. I have chosen to call it, it's my own term, economic slavery. She's an economic slave of her husband. And even in liberal countries, it's not easy for a woman to live by herself with children. In the countries that this movement represents, 
that would apply to at least three quarters of the countries. Women can't earn money and they feel stuck in the relationship. And people will dare to say, oh, she had a choice to leave. And in the study last September the 11th, I compared that definition of choice with the one of celibacy. Juxtapositioning is two different things. Parables are two similar things. That's only a very superficial definition. If you want to use parables and not juxtapose, If I said to you, you're homosexual, you can do what you want. You're free, free to choose what you do and who you do it with. Oh, but by the way, you're a Christian. Oh, and by the way, according to Romans chapter one, and there's other five verses, if you do what you want, if you choose, you can't go to heaven. But it's your choice. That's the parabolic equivalent to the woman in an abusive relationship. That's what this celibacy issue is about. We force people to be celibate. It's not voluntary when you do that. It's not voluntary when we frame the, the issue in, in those terms. So for all of those, all of you who are disappointed, I'm not a prophet and I can't tell you what the future holds. But as of 9-11, 2021, I never made any statement that people who come out of abusive marriage can remarry. I did not say that. And you need to listen to the story. Not just be excited about the answer. Because you'll get it wrong anyway. So I've spent quite a bit of time on that issue. Because I thought it's important. not only to address that subject directly with you, but also to explore the pitfalls of the mistakes that people are making.
and we're so and we're so close to the end. I fear that there are people even in this meeting who are going to lose their salvation. Because they have a superficial commitment. And they think that, I will say it this way, they think this movement has now given them freedom and liberty. I would argue that the constraints are more today than they were before. It's harder to get into heaven now than it was three years ago, five years ago. Because the standards are much higher. Not only has the prophetic message not lessened, not weakened, not changed. Lessened, weakened, changed. But on top of that, the standard of behavior, the expectation is much higher. It's a new commandment. There are people listening who are in this movement 10 years ago. And you know the culture that we used to have back then. Study the message, don't look at the messenger. Don't talk about people's private lives. And if a speaker abuses his wife, A little bit. Who are we to judge? Then they quote some other white statement about the family circle and not letting the secrets out. The abuse wasn't worse then than it is now. It's just now it's more exposed and it's not tolerated. Hence, I contend that heaven is harder to attain today than it was yesterday. And for all of you who are relaxing, Asking your baptismal teachers how low the standard can go. Carry on. At your own peril. Call me your mate. Mate is an English term that says you're just one of us. Disrespect Elder Tessie's eldership. Neither of us really care. You only do so, sorry, by doing so, you only damage and harm your own salvation. So this is a convenient point for us to finish our presentation.
it's uh, perhaps a little earlier than we we might have finished. We're due to start on the hour. So perhaps if we could start five minutes earlier. And we'll continue our study where we picked off, where, so we, we'll pick it up from where we finished um, last September. Uh, before I do finish, I wanna make this point. We'll, cap, we'll, we'll start on the hour normally because I'm gonna, it's gonna take me five minutes to make this point. And translators are not supposed to laugh, they're just supposed to translate. Okay, so I receive a lot of criticism from my presentations. Which is fair enough. A common one is the following. I have no idea what you're talking about. So, so that's the criticism. They don't understand what I'm talking about. That is the criticism. They don't understand what I'm talking about. I've tried to explain but obviously not well. Now people have an expectation where when I'm going to present that they think they know what I'm going to say and do. So when I began speaking about homosexuality, the rights and wrongs, Everyone's expecting me to deal with the six verses, three from the Old Testament and three from the New. Leviticus. Leviticus. Romans. Romans. Ephesians. Timothy. So they want me to deal with these verses. And I didn't do that. I approached the subject from a different way. The better way. Well, better for me, but not for you, because you don't understand what I'm doing. Joking aside, it's really important when you're a teacher to consider how you approach a subject. These are not mind games like expect the unexpected. It seems to me inappropriate just to go into those verses sequentially. If I had done that, if I can express it this way, we would not have won the argument. Explaining verses does not help people. I'll give you an example of that. 
the summer of 2019 in France. God speaks to Elder Tess. She's not an elder yet. And God says to her, tell the people, the women, to wear trousers. And there the rest of us are. Thinking, doesn't she know the verses? Ask people who are there. Watch the presentations, the studies that she did. There was no mention of Deuteronomy. No discussion about what Ellen White said. She didn't express it this way. But she's telling us, God told me this is what we're going to do, so we're going to do it. And we're all saying, by what authority are you going to make these changes? We won't answer that question because we should all know what the answer is. I'm going to say that was July. And if we go forward, six months, we're now in Africa, Uganda. And now we're going to tackle the verses. Six months after the commandment comes. So I want us to know, to be clear, how God operates. I want to go back 13 years. 14 years, 2007. Elder Jeff is teaching error. And what is his error? He stood up and said, God told me before that the latter rain is before the Sunday law. We know that's not true. So when members started standing up and resisting that, and said, that's not according to inspiration. You know what he said? Of course, you're right. I didn't realize. Do you believe that? Of course you don't. Do you believe that? Of course you do not. He told them to get lost, literally. And they did. They left the movement and are lost. I'm going to say approximately 'll say um, I say eight years, nine years. Eight or nine years. 
not six months, not six months, eight or nine years is how long it took this movement to give an answer to that question. Going to go back in 2015, 16, go back to 2007 and explain what happened. Now, many of you don't know that history. Many of you do not know that history. We did not lose a member. We lost half a continent. We lost half a continent. And he didn't care. You either get on board or you leave. And you're not going to get a proper answer for eight or nine years. So if you don't know what I'm talking about, because I do things in a different way, Do yourself a favor and be patient. It won't be eight years before I answer. I hope it won't be six months. But I don't do things in the conventional way. I want to say God doesn't. Expect the unexpected. But if you stick with the methodology, it will all make sense. And what I am trying to do in since um, the formalization of the message in August up till now, what I'm trying to do since the formalization of the message until now is to look at the subject of homosexuality and same sex marriage. and explore the subject from the perspective of inspiration. And inspiration is more than six verses, it's thousands of verses. And if I choose to go to Matthew 19 to begin the subject don't be surprised let's close with prayer and we'll meet on the hour right only god Speak to each of us who are bowed before you. Help us to re-examine ourselves. To see if we are in the faith. Help us to understand who and what we really are. Our problems are not that we might lie to you or that we might hide things from you. Our problem is that we don't understand ourselves. Our prayer is that you would open our eyes to who and what we really are.
In Jesus' name. Amen.